Hello friends, Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to our latest video. This video was suggested by longtime subscriber and fan, Kendall Berg. She writes in the comments section, please do Crater Lake, Oregon. I'm an Oregon native and would love to hear stories from my home state. Also, I love your channel. Thank you for all the stories. I love them. Well, Kendall, thank you for your comment. We appreciate your kind words. And we also took your request to heart. So, Kendall and everyone, please join us now for five strange disappearances and mysteries from Crater Lake, Oregon. Now, some of these stories can be found in my latest book, National Park Mysteries and Disappearances, Volume 3, The Pacific Northwest, which includes Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. It's available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format, and it's also available wherever fine books are sold. There is a link in the description. Now, on to Crater Lake. First, I feel a little background and history is in order. Crater Lake National Park was established in 1902 and is located in southern Oregon. In total, the park covers 183,224 acres, which includes Crater Lake and the surrounding hills and forests. Many years ago, Mount Mazama collapsed, creating a nearly 2,118-foot deep caldera that partially fills Crater Lake. The amount of water in the lake is replaced approximately every 250 years by rain and snow, which offsets the evaporation. This is the deepest lake in the United States, measuring some 1,949 feet. For maximum depth, it ranks ninth in the world, while for mean slash average depth, it ranks third. There are two small islands in Crater Lake. Located near the lake's western shore, Wizard Island is approximately 316 acres in size, while Phantom Ship, a natural rock pillar, is located near its southern shore. Because the lake has no inlets or tributaries, its waters are some of the purest in the world due to the lack of pollutants. There are relatively high levels of dissolved salts in the lake as well. Due to its high elevation and influence from the Pacific, Crater Lake has a subalpine climate. Summers are mild and dry, but winters are cold and snowy, with average snowfalls reaching 505 inches per year and maximum snow cover of 139 inches or 3.53 meters. It usually takes until mid-July for the snow to melt. Even into the summer, hard frosts are possible in the Crater Lake area. The surface temperature of the lake ranges from 33 degrees Fahrenheit to 66 degrees. In the summertime, the lake normally fluctuates between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, as a result of the collapse of Mount Mazama, Crater Lake had no fish until a man named William G. Steele decided to stock it in 1888 in order to allow for fishing. The fish were regularly stocked until 1941, when it became evident that the fish could maintain a stable population without assistance from the outside. Two fish species have survived from the original stocking, kokanee salmon and rainbow trout, with the salmon being the most abundant. As part of its history, Crater Lake is also known for the old man of the lake, a full-size tree that's been bobbing in the water for over a century. As a result of the low temperatures of the lake, the decomposition of the wood has been slowed considerably. Crater Lake is sacred to the Klamath tribe, a Native Americans indigenous to the area. Generations ago, they told of it being the crossing point between Skell, a spirit from above, and Lao, a spirit from below. Andrea Lankford, author of Haunted Hikes, Spine-Tingling Tales and Trails from North America's National Parks, writes this of Crater Lake. Lao and Skell fought gory battles here. Lao ripped Skull's heart from his chest, and Skell retaliated by dismembering Lao and throwing the body parts into the lake. Hideous monsters gobbled up everything but Lao's head, but the lake still holds Lao's spirit. When stirred, he may brew up storm clouds. When angered, he may appear in the form of a giant crayfish that climbs up out of the lake, snatches people off the rim of the crater that surrounds the lake, and drags them down into the water. So, now that we know what Crater Lake is, how it was formed, and what it represents to the indigenous tribes of the area, let us look into the first disappearance, that of little Sammy Bulky. In the early afternoon of October 14, 2006, Sammy Bulky, aged eight, was playing near the Cleetwood Cove area in Crater Lake National Park with his father, Kenneth Bulky, 48. 
Sammy disappeared into the woods after running up a cinder slope. Despite his passion for life, Sammy was stubborn at times. Also, as a result of having a mild form of autism, he was terrified of loud noises and bright lights. At the time of his disappearance, Sammy stood four feet eleven inches tall, weighed eighty-five pounds, and had short brown hair and brown eyes. The last time he was seen, he was wearing a long sleeve black and green t-shirt, jeans, a blue coat, and red suede slip-on shoes with rubber soles. While the little boy did have camping experience, he had no formal wilderness survival training given his young age. At around 4 p.m. that day, the Bulky family had pulled over at a pullout 500 yards east of the Cleetwood Cove parking lot area and were walking north along Rim Drive. Sammy and his father were playing hide-and-seek on a gravel slope, but Sammy saw some yellow that he thought might be gold. Sammy stayed on the slope, refusing to come down, and as darkness approached, his father walked a short distance to their car to return to their Diamond Lake cabin. Kenny Bulky chased after Sammy, but Sammy stayed at least 50 feet ahead, likely considering it a game. I never caught up with him, his father said, and at that point he disappeared over the top somewhere and I lost him. Within a matter of hours, more than 200 people were combing an area of about six square miles or 4,000 acres. Dogs, helicopters, and heat-sensing cameras were used to search for the boy for a week, but he was never found. Authorities said a helicopter crew spotted some tracks, but they turned out to be most likely animal tracks. After that, the search continued intermittently despite heavy snowfalls in the area. 7,000 feet above sea level, the park gets more than 500 inches of snow per year. Although it was unlikely Sammy would have fallen into the lake because of obstacles on the slope, Technical climbing crews searched the slopes from the rim of the caldera down to the shoreline. Participating in the search were SAR teams from Jackson, Klamath, and Deschutes counties, National Park Service searchers, and trackers from California, Washington, and Oregon. Mount Hood and Mount Rainier rescue teams were also involved, as well as volunteers consisting of employees from the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service. It seems more than a little odd that a boy of Sammy's age, who was just slightly autistic, would run off into the woods without any reason at all and continue going until he was out of sight and hearing range of his father. Because it was cold, his first instinct, we would think, would be to turn around and return to his dad, especially if he was calling for him, no matter how long he'd been hidden from him. Sadly, no trace was ever found, and Sammy remains missing. Next up, we have the strange disappearance of Derek Ingebretson. East of the Cascade Range in south-central Oregon lies Upper Klamath Lake, a large, shallow, freshwater lake. Pelican Butte rises over 3,800 feet above the shore of Crater Lake as a steep-sided, dormant volcano located 28 miles south of the crater. Sometime in the afternoon on December 5, 1998, Eric Ingebretson, his father Robert, and his grandfather Bob, 64, set out for a densely wooded mountainside above Upper Klamath Lake, about 30 miles north of Klamath Falls. They planned to find a Christmas tree for the holiday season. Derek was lost and never seen again. Because of his love of the outdoors, Derek was known as Bear Boy, even at the age of eight. A week after he was born, his mother carried him on a bear hunt in a pack. In his youth, he hunted with his father and picked mushrooms with his mother's father. On several of his mushroom expedition outings, he had visited Pelican Butte in the past. The Ingebretson family did not plan to go Christmas tree hunting that year in the woods, although Robert looked forward to a family Christmas tree hunt every year. It was his wife, Lori, who convinced him to use an artificial tree that year. Lori wanted to keep the mess to a minimum, but when a disabled neighbor asked for a tree, Robert decided to go into the woods. Bob remembers telling the group that since it was already 2 p.m., it would be dark around 4 p.m. since it was late in the year, and he was driving along West Side Road in his red Toyota pickup. On his way to Rocky Point Resort, Bob pulled into a turnout at milepost 12. The three of them climbed up an embankment into a pine forest, and Robert helped Derek get into his blue snowsuit. Derek walked behind Robert, who told him to stay with his grandfather. Derek nagged his grandfather that he wanted to catch up with his dad as he chopped at small trees with his hatchet. 
At some point, the grandfather relented, and the boy headed off in search of his father. With the darkness closing in, Robert and Bob met back up and asked each other, Where's Derek? Robert recalls asking. Grandpa Bob replied, I thought he was with you. No, he was with you. Despite the steady falling of heavy wet snow, Robert turned on his heels and went back up the hill. He called out to Derek, but no response came. Robert then flagged down a man named Fred Hines, a motorist who was driving along at about 4.13 p.m., and requested he dial 911 so the authorities could be notified. In the resort, two miles away from the area where Derek vanished, Hines made the call. Over the course of two weeks, hundreds of people searched through several feet of snow, using snowmobiles and dogs to search for Derek. Lori slept in a donated camper van at the turnout, hoping Derek might see the bonfire and come to her. Once, she thought she saw Derek waving and smiling at her. However, it turned out she was just delirious from lack of sleep. Derek's tracks were found by Robert, his dad, and other members of the family in the newly fallen snow in the hours immediately following his disappearance. Apparently, Derek had laid down in a clearing near the road to make a snow angel when his boot prints were spotted near the spot where Robert had last seen him. There had been a snowplow that came by, and sadly, the tracks leading away from the angel were obliterated. There were no tracks leading towards the woods from the snow angel. A small area of trees near the road was damaged by Derek's hatchet cuts. His father was confident that his son did not re-enter the woods. Early in the evening, five to eight inches of snow had fallen on the point. A candy wrapper was found, and a makeshift lean-to shelter was found made out of branches, but it was unclear whether the candy wrapper or the lean-to were the handiwork of Derek. Derek's family believed that he had made his way to the road and was probably picked up by a stranger, although this explanation was, for some reason, dismissed by the sheriff. Bob discovered a hole in the ice and a child's footprint on the bank during the search. The next day, however, divers searched this area, and additional searches were carried out during the spring thaw. However, nothing was found. Lori and Robert were informed, sadly, by the Klamath County authorities that their son was most likely deceased eight days after he disappeared. During the next seven days, Robert, Lori, and about 100 volunteers stayed on the mountain. Speculation intensified that Derek had been kidnapped. When sub-zero temperatures forced the Ingebretsons to end their search on December 18, 1998, Robert drove straight from his graveyard shift at work to the mountain to meet Lori every weekend for the next two years. These search areas were marked on a map by the couple. It was widely believed that the authorities were too slow to arrive at the scene the night Derek disappeared, which led to criticism of the search and rescue effort. The search did not begin in earnest until nearly five hours after the first 911 call because the coordinator was reluctant to interrupt a Christmas dinner at Molly's restaurant for the annual award dinner of the Klamath County Search and Rescue Team before he was certain a rescue was needed. Despite passing polygraphs, Robert and Grandpa Bob remained suspects in Derek's case, and at least thought to have been negligent in some way. Despite the grandfather's insistence, Robert no longer spoke to him. The blame for not finding Derek did indeed go to the father, but the father felt the blame for losing him went to Grandpa Bob. Ingebretson was too overwhelmed with guilt to even think of talking about it. Robert took leave of work for several weeks, and Derek's family spent thousands of dollars looking for him. They even paid for psychics and a boat to search Klamath Lake. They eventually went bankrupt due to these efforts. The authorities claimed that Derek had simply wandered off into the woods and died, and his remains had been scattered by animals. However, the Ingebretson family never really believed that especially since no remains, torn clothing, nothing was ever found. There was even a witness who said he had seen a man and a boy struggling on a highway nearby. Then, in 1999, strange graffiti was found scrawled on a rest area bathroom near Burns, stating that Derek had been killed and buried. It was later ruled a cruel hoax by the FBI. A boy named Derek was found in Texas under unusual circumstances, and he looked a lot like the Ingebretson's son, but was actually a different person. Then, later on in 2000, after several days of waiting for confirmation, a bone discovered in Pelican Butte was identified as being from a deer. In 2001, the family mailbox received a handwritten letter. 
The letter read, I know who took your son. On July 11, 2000, Frank J. Milligan, 31-year-old state youth authority worker, approached a 10-year-old boy at a Dallas park and offered him $100 to mow his lawn. In Milligan's car, the man asked the boy, Do you want to live or die? Milligan bound the boy's hands with duct tape and then forced him to walk down a dirt road where he assaulted him. After this vicious assault, Miller left the boy for dead. Despite the odds, the boy woke up covered in his own blood and got to a road where a passing motorist stopped to help him. In this letter to the police and the Ingebretsons, admitted that Milligan had confessed to doing away with Derek. The letter arrived at the Ingebretson home in late 2001. In another letter that arrived at the home in 2001, Milligan's cellmate claimed that Milligan had admitted to him that he had been the one that ended young Derek's life. A detective from the Oregon State Police who investigated the Dallas case confronted Milligan. Milligan reportedly confessed to the crime and agreed to lead investigators to the body. The FBI used ground-penetrating radar to scan for bones at Silver Falls State Park, southeast of Salem, Oregon, where Lori and Robert drove for five hours. There were no results after several days of searching. An assistant district attorney told the Ingebretson that Milgan had agreed to plead guilty to killing the young boy if they spared him the death penalty. However, after Milgan was presented with the paperwork a few days later, he refused to sign the confession. Was Derek Ingebretson abducted by Frank Milligan or someone else, as the police believed, or did he simply die from the cold or maybe even an animal attack? This mysterious case remains unsolved. Next up, Charles McCuller, the melting man of Crater Lake. January 7, 1975. 18-year-old aspiring photographer Charles McCuller was a free spirit at heart. He was living in Virginia when he decided there was so much to explore in national parks across the United States. Charles was said to be very reliable and kept in close contact with his family, even on the long trips that he liked to take. Deciding to put more effort into his photography and wanting to visit a friend in Oregon, Charles packed a small backpack and left everything else behind, even his beloved Volkswagen bus. He would make his way across the country with the occasional bus ride, but mostly by hitchhiking. He wanted to see all the national parks in the United States, and one of those parks, in particular, caught his attention. Crater Lake National Park in Oregon. It was a convenient place for him to start, as his friend lived nearby. Very little facts surround this case, and Charles passed, so why he decided to leave at the very moment he did is still unclear. What was clear, however, by a conversation he had with his father, was that Charles wanted something different, and he was going to start his search at Crater Lake National Park in Oregon. Charles McCuller would leave Virginia the very next day. Sadly, this would be the last time his family would ever see him. January 8, 1975, mostly hitchhiking across the United States, Charles' first significant stop was in Yuma, Arizona. Between January 16th and the 22nd of that year, he had regular contact with his parents, calling often to check in and update them on his progress and future plans. On January 29th, Charles placed one more call to his parents to let them know he had made it to Eugene, Oregon, and was staying with his friend. This was the last call the McCullers would receive from their son. He told his friends that he would be staying at Crater Lake for two days because he wanted to photograph the area's winter landscape, and that if he wasn't back by February 1st, to send help. This was the last contact Charles' friends ever had with him. It was reported during the search several people saw Charles around the Diamond Lake area on the 29th, and a man that was cutting trees close to the park had picked Charles up and dropped him off near the park entrance. Not being from the area, Charles wasn't well-versed with the terrain he planned to photograph. The winter months at Crater Lake can be very and unexpectedly harsh for the ill-prepared. In fact, it's not rare for the area to see several feet of snow from one storm. And at the time of Charles' disappearance, the weather report for Crater Lake stated there was 24 to 90 inches on the ground with snow drifts of over 20 feet. Temperatures at that time were well below freezing, dipping down into the teens at night and just over freezing during the day. Wind gusts themselves hampered search and rescue efforts which were compounded and made worse with the blowing snow. 
February 1st had came and went, and there was no word from Charles. He was reported missing by his friends that day. The search for Charles McCuller was underway at a rapid pace. The teams knew they had to make haste as the weather was already bad and was getting worse and wouldn't hold for very long, as there was a storm forecast for that night which called for more heavy snow and gale force winds up to 60 miles an hour. Ground and aerial searches lasted for that day and into the night and early morning hours of February 2nd. The search was called off around 2 a.m. due to the worsening weather conditions. The search continued intermittently over the next several days, although with a scaled-down number of searchers, again due to the weather conditions. Local police didn't contact the McCullers until February 10th to notify them about their son's disappearance. Also notified at the same time was the FBI. Both Charles' parents and the FBI made their way to the park and joined in the search efforts. The efforts were still slow, though, as the snowdrifts in the latest storm were 12 feet deep or more, making it almost impossible to even find where Charles' camp may have been located. The initial search lasted for months without any sign of him being found whatsoever. Charles' father stayed at Crater Lake, camping by the shoreline throughout that spring and summer, tirelessly looking for his son. Sadly, he never found anything. A full year and a half later, two hikers that were on the Pacific Crest Trail made a long turn and ended up 12 miles into a remote and boggy area of the park where they came upon a threadbare backpack that contained, among other things, a Volkswagen key. The hikers marked the area with a piece of clothing, then made their way to the ranger station and informed them of what they had found, showing them the area where to go on a map they had marked. While going through the contents of the bag, the hikers made a remark about the strange-shaped key that had been found. A part-time park ranger that had been a part of the initial search for Charles, named Marion Jack, happened to be at the ranger station that day and overheard the conversation. As curiosity aroused, he walked over to the men and looked at the key. He remembered the flyers that were made when Charles went missing, and one of the photos on the flyer was of the key. It turned out to be an important piece of evidence, one they could link to Charles McCullough. A new search party was formed, and from the information given by the hikers, they trekked into Sphagnum Bog, an area that was a full 12 miles off trail of where Charles was supposed to have been. The key that was found was later matched to the one Charles owned. Further searches would turn up a mysterious scene indeed. Charles' remains were found in a state of undress, and only his lower half was left. His jeans were unbuttoned and his belt undone. His legs were broken at the shin bones, and they were sticking straight up. His socks contained his feet bones. The only other part of the body that was found was the crown of his skull, and it was over ten feet away from the other parts of his body. It was as if his upper body simply melted away. His camera equipment, along with his money, boots, coat, and shirt, were all missing just as was the rest of him. The creepiest part was his jeans were found in a sitting position on a falling log. It was as if he had just been sitting, staring at the lake, when the unthinkable happened. Some have speculated that Charles McCuller was suffering from hypothermia, which caused a condition known as paradoxical undressing. This condition happens when the core body temperature drops below 94 degrees, and because of the heat loss, victims begin to think they are too hot. They start removing their clothing to alleviate the heat, when in reality, they are freezing to death all the more faster. This theory would explain his missing clothes, but what about the money and the camera equipment? And what happened to the other half of his remains? How did he get a full 12 miles into this bog in snow that was over 100 inches deep? And why was the FBI called in to search for Charles? In 2016, Stephen McCullough wrote an article on his brother's case. It reads, quote, If only those broken shin bones could have talked to us. What do you think they would say? I bet they'd say something like this. I hitched a ride with this creepy guy who stole my camera equipment and money and then took my life. Then, on a clear day in the dead of winter, he hauled my body into the remotest part of Crater Lake, took my shirt and boots off, and set me up on a log and left, figuring the animals would destroy the evidence by spring. And hey, I guess it worked, because the cops ruled the death to be from natural causes. My dad doesn't buy it, though. End quote. At the time of this recording, there have been no new developments in the sad case of Charles McCuller. Next up, 
a 70-year-old mystery in Crater Lake National Park. On July 21, 1952, while searching for missing United Service Motors executives on a beautiful sunny summer's day at Crater Lake National Park, a group of part-time park workers found the bodies of the two men who had been murdered, execution style. Their neckties had been used as gags and remained in their mouths. Could this case have been solved 70 years ago? First, let's take a look at who they were. The men found on the trail that day were 53-year-old Charles Patrick Culhaney of Detroit, Michigan, and 56-year-old Albert Marston Jones of San Francisco, California. Both men were United Service Motor Executives, an ancillary company of General Motors. The men were at Crater Lake National Park to do some sightseeing and have a relaxing day. They'd been in town attending meetings in Klamath Falls for the company. Both men wanted to do some fishing at the Union Creek area and had made plans to meet up with business associates John Vaughn, Frank Everlin, and Everlin's 13-year-old son. The fishing trip would be later in the day as Vaughn and Everlin had to work a half day before they could close the shop. As the local men made their way to the fishing spot, they passed the South Park entrance around 3 p.m. and saw Albert Jones' car, a 1951 Green Pontiac, sitting on the side of the road on Highway 62. This was near the Annie Creek Canyon area. Jones and Colhaney weren't in the car nor around the area. As Vaughn and Everlin pulled up alongside the car, they could see the passenger door ajar, which seemed to be off to them. Exiting their vehicle, they called out for Jones and Colhaney, but never got an answer. Luggage could be seen from the window, as well as a camera sitting on the seat and the car keys still hung from the ignition. Vaughn touched the hood of the car and found it to still be warm. The three men stood around talking for a bit, waiting for the others to possibly return. Around an hour later, and having searched a little in the immediate area, two of the three men left to go call for help, while the third remained with the car just in case they returned. While the two men were gone, Eberlin, who was waiting at the car, heard another car approaching. He says, one car came through crunching gravel, then really took off fast. I didn't think much about it at the time, but now I wonder if that was them, and they were returning to the car and saw someone inside it, and, adios, let's get out of here. Once alerted, rangers started a search that day for the missing men. One of the searchers that day was a man named Rex Ash, and he was the one who found the bodies. We were working west from the highway, all spread out about 20 feet apart, he recalls. I thought, oh lordy, there they are. It was a really hot summer day, and they'd started to bloat. I'd never seen a dead body before. Ash alerted the other searchers to the find, and they all came rushing over. It was a bunch of kids, and everyone was gathering around to see what was happening, Ash went on to say. We might have accidentally destroyed some of the evidence. We didn't touch anything, but we tore up the terrain quite a bit. One member of the search crew took his camera out and started taking pictures. He stepped over Jones and Culhaney and around them and practically got in their faces. He had plans to sell these to a true crime magazine and make a fortune, but fortunately the FBI took them away, recalled John Owings, another one of the searchers. Owings and Ash were tasked with staying with the bodies until officials could arrive. We were sitting there, scared to death, wondering which one of us was going to be next, Owings recounted. It was one of the worst nights of my life. Ash and Owens finished out the summer at the park and returned to their respective homes. On Monday, July 21, 1952, at 3.27 p.m., an FBI agent and Oregon State Police Private L.W. Heron arrived at the murder scene and took over the investigation. Culhaney was the first to be processed. He was laying on his back, legs out, and right arm across his chest. His dentures were in his shirt pocket. He had been shot once in the back of his head, and in addition to the gunshot wound, his groin area was bruised. Jones' fate was similar. He was also on his back, feet towards Culhaney, arms by his side, bruised groin, and a single gunshot wound to the back of his head. What set Jones' injuries apart from Culhaney was his skull was fractured. Both men were shoeless, but their socked feet were clean. Their ties had been used as gags. Also, both men had been robbed as their watches and money was missing, and one man's pair of shoes were nowhere to be found. A few other clues were found at the scene. State Trooper Heron, who has since passed away, was, quote, fascinated by the case and worked on it initially until the FBI took over. He talked about it and looked into it for a couple of years, end quote, 
Now, that's according to his wife, Ruth Heron, now 77 and still living in Klamath Falls. Heron had suspected the killers were a couple of men named John Wesley Cole and Kenneth Moore, both of Chiloquin. A few years before the jones Colhaney murders, Moore had been convicted of tying up and robbing two trappers in the woods. A woman came forward with a story saying that Moore had confessed to the murders and had told her late husband. This was according to OSP reports. Justice would come swift and harsh to Cole and Moore if they were, in fact, guilty of the murders. They were both found frozen to death in Klamath County in 1962, however. Aaron had suspected the two men because they were outlaws around that area at the time that the Culhaney and Jones murders occurred. Days after the murders, the police talked to over 200 park employees and took statements from several people that had been in the area. One of those people was Lincoln Lenz. His initial report read, He, Lenz, was driving canned goods to the lodge that he drove a truck for on July 19, 1952. He says he saw two men wearing work clothes with two other men that were described as white-collar types. The men were being led into the woods where the executives were later found dead. As he continued down the road toward the lodge, he heard what he described as two firecracker-type bangs. Later that day, Lenz was followed and harassed by two scruffy-looking men who also followed him the next day. This is what made him surmise they were the killers. Lenz gave a description of the men. The older one was the most distinctive. He wore a beaded belt that appeared to spell out Ralph. He had a tattoo of a bikini-clad female on his right forearm, and he was missing a finger. Lenz said the FBI dismissed the story and called him a smart aleck. If the FBI had come back to me, I could have showed them even where the killer's car had been parked and beer cans that might have had their fingerprints, he recounted. He was able to remember more details after the initial interview. After the lodge had closed in the fall and I returned to the University of Oregon, I tried to contact the agents several more times. They never returned my calls, possibly because they thought it was impossible for me to see them walking those guys into the forest and hearing the gunshots, even though the area was a quarter of a mile off the highway. Two days after the murders, a man that gave a fake identification, J.D. Harney, that supposedly lived at 536 Plum Street in Medford, Oregon, made a long-distance call from a payphone at the Southern Pacific Railroad Depot at 1.15 p.m. He asked the operator to put the call through to Garage, the only one in Fort Klamath, a small community near Crater Lake. The operator contacted the FBI after hearing of the murders to let them know about the strange phone call and the even stranger request made by the caller. She recounted that the man seemed rather angry, like he wanted to take my head off, because she wasn't able to put the call through until 1.45 later that afternoon. The business, called Wilmer Garage, was closed until then. When he finally got through the garage, he told the owners that a friend of his named Jones was in the hospital and needed his car picked up from the park and stored at their garage until he got out. He said the keys were in the ignition. The police quickly descended on the area where the call was placed from, but no one was there. However, a train depot worker was able to give a description of the caller. He was around 5'7", sandy-colored hair, slender, and was wearing a brightly colored shirt that was yellow and red with short sleeves. The police checked out the name and address the caller gave, but both were fake. Fingerprints were taken from the receiver and the coins inside the phone. However, no one was ever identified. In 1994, the granddaughter of one of the murdered men had a different take on what happened. While going through her late mother's belongings, she discovered two letters that were written but unsent. One stated that she, the daughter, thought it was an organized hit. The letter read, I think they, the Santos gang, saw the fancy car and it was a case of robbery, even though people say there is more to it than that. I just don't think so. I think it was Jack Santo, Emmett Perkins, and Barbara Graham in their gang. Their method of operation fits and their motive was always robbery. This particular gang was executed in 1955 for other murders. Retired Medford police officer Bob Allen said, The FBI swooped in and took over the case because it happened in a national park. All they could do was speculate about why and who had committed such a crime. It just doesn't sound like anyone from around here, Allen said. The town's worst crime up to that point were safe robbers and bad check writers. Last spring, Cheryl Alsey, 47, was taking class at Rogue Community College when she heard about the Crater Lake murders and decided to write a paper on them. She spent over three months investigating the deaths. Her extensive report is now part of the files at the Southern Oregon Historical Society. Culhaney was a big muckety-muck with the company 
and there were problems with the union back then. It was a hit. She gave the presentation on the murders at the Klamath County Museum. A little over 30 seniors showed up. The last man to walk in was what was described as a suspicious-looking man in a long shirt, she said. Housie's friend noticed the man because the way he studied the names in the guest book so intensely, and he was missing a finger. As of this recording, the Crater Lake murders remain unsolved. Last up, we have the legend of the missing prospector. The story of the lost cabin mine, a cabin, and a prospector known as Set Em Up is a legend about an area of land not too far from Crater Lake, where it was said that the man named Set Em Up had successful prospects of the gold rush that was hitting the area. The legend, as recited by a group of California prospectors from days gone by, was told like this. The argument over the first white man to discover Crater Lake has been disputed for years. In the 1840s, it was said to have been discovered by John C. Fremont, while others claim it wasn't until 1853. At that time, Oregon's first major gold rush had hit the area, and prospectors came from all around, chomping at the bit to find their riches. Having already found the Jackson Creek area, new prospectors pushed further into the wilderness looking for a rumored lost cabin mine that was said to be chock full of gold. A group of men from California owned a plot of land that said to have a small cabin and a gold mine that produced a lot of gold on it. One day, the Oregon men that owned the land came under attack by local natives and to protect their gold, buried a hoard of it to keep the natives from taking it. Three of the four men were killed. The lone survivor was said to have divulged certain landmarks to set them up, leading to where the cabin and buried treasure were. Soon after the man gave the information out, he disappeared as well. Neither man has ever been found, and the cabin and mine's whereabouts are still a mystery to this day. Years later, a group of prospectors, also from California, were relaxing in a local saloon one night, telling stories of their successes and drinking their fill of whiskey. One of the men, having had consumed more than needed to loosen his lips, was telling his group about the legend of the lost miner, the cabin and the gold mine, and the riches contained at the mine as well as the cabin. The miner was said to return to town with pockets full of gold from prospecting the area. The miner, only known as Set Em Up, because that was how he always greeted people when he came into the local saloon, was rumored to have a cabin with maps of the missing mine and a loot of gold within. When the old miner would need something, he would come to town with pockets full of gold nuggets from his secret mine. The man also spoke about Set Em Up having gone missing under strange circumstances. He was headed off into the woods with a couple of shady characters from Jacksonville that were known thieves. Sitting not too far from the California men, a local prospecting group overheard the man's tale and took notice. Glancing at each other from around the table as they tossed back a strong shot of whiskey, the men leaned into each other and quietly started to devise their plan. They would follow the Californians to the mine and, hey, if they found the old man along the way, even better. They would be town heroes and maybe he would tell them where the mine was for their troubles of searching for him. This search for the lost mine and cabin would lead to the discovery of Crater Lake. But for now, both groups of men had gold in their sights. They would look for the missing prospector and his rumored loot, but little did they know, the journey they were about to embark upon would almost cause them to become missing as well. Now, the lost cabin mine wasn't exactly said to be specifically in the Crater Lake area. Other sources said it was actually in California and the missing miner would return home to Jacksonville with his gold to throw off any would-be thieves or snoopy men looking to find his secret mine. But, being as the California group had prospected all over that state and found nothing that resembled the landscape said to inhabit the lost cabin nor mine, they were convinced it was in Oregon, and specifically just a few miles from where they sat. It's said that as soon as the California group left for their search, the Oregon group collected provisions and set out hot on their trail to share in the imagined wealth. The Oregon party had 11 men, and the California party had four. Not long after both parties set out, they discovered each other, and it became a game of cat and mouse. The California group would cut through the thick brush, spread out from each other, and then double back to confuse the Oregon group. The now large group of men had been searching for the cabin and gold for days. Their provisions began to dwindle, so a truce was called, and the men joined each other in order to survive. Realizing they had wandered off their objective, but failing to realize just how far they were past where they wanted to be, they were getting dangerously close to the Rogue River. 
It was decided at this point the healthier, stronger men in the group would forge ahead while the others turned back. When the men that were continuing left the camp, they had no way of knowing just how close one of them would come to death that day and would watch another man die. By riding on a small trail on a sloping mountain, one of the men soon came upon a rim of a lake thought to be Klamath Lake, but it was actually Crater Lake. He was within feet of falling off the edge before his mule stopped. I was convinced that had I been on a blind mule, I would have ridden right over the edge to my death, Hillman stated. Each man looked on in wonder at the lake and stated how beautiful it was before making their way back into the forest. The men returned to camp and contemplated what to call the lake they had just found. Two names were chosen, Mysterious Lake and Deep Blue Lake, were the last of the two names chosen as a final name. The men documented their find by writing each of their names on a piece of paper and fixing the paper to a stick at the rim of the lake. It was decided they would return to Jacksonville, as they hadn't found the lost miner, the cabin, nor the gold. The men returned to Jacksonville the next day. Some were excited over the find of the lake, and others just didn't seem to care. By the time they had made it back, most of the men were so exhausted and famished, they couldn't even call the direction of the lake. The other men just didn't care. A few years later, Hillman would return to the area where the lake had been discovered. He had agreed to take a group of people to see it, as word had spread by then, and people had become curious. Legend has it that as Hillman approached the edge of Crater Lake, this time his horse lost its balance and fell over the side. Hillman and the horse died at the scene. The lake had tried to claim him the first time he had come, and was successful this time. A local Native American medicine man was quoted as saying, If that lake wants you, it will find a way to take you. It's cursed. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of these strange true stories from Crater Lake? I look forward to your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. In the meanwhile, be good to yourselves and each other, and I'll see you just a little further down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time. Tell your animal Steve says hi.